Aloha, everyone. I'm Jason Schwartz, your host of The Neutral Zone, MauiNeutralZone.com. Today is the 28th of May in 2020. And if I was outside, you'd see me wearing a mask because we are right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I don't even have to tell you what that means. You guys are all pros now. Pandemic means an epidemic pan, like the whole globe, everywhere. And um, I have a special guest today. You're, you're looking at him. That's Houston Wade. Houston will tell you a little more about himself. I had someone here that it was from Maui who said, you should speak to this guy. His stuff is so important. And I said, absolutely. So we jumped on it for you. Um, you can find these shows at MauiNeutralZone.com. You can find them up at KAKU Radio. You can find them up on YouTube. We put them all up on the web so that they're available for everyone everywhere. Houston, welcome to our show. Houston Wade from- Thank you so much. Where are you from? From Bainbridge Island? Yes, uh, right across the water from Seattle. Seattle, Washington. For yeah. those of you around the world, the west coast of the United States, one of the, I want to say, one of the first breakout areas was just across the water from you, wasn't it? Just yeah, it was, it was Snohomish County, so uh, about, about 30 miles from us. But across yeah. the water. So yep. you know, we have water around us, too. It creates a very different environment than on the mainland. So what do you do? I mean, I understand you as a professor. What do you, what's yes. your specialty? I'm a, a math and astrophysics professor. Oh, so, okay. yes. Astrophysics so I, I, and math. Yeah, so I, I teach all levels of math from, from basic arithmetic all the way through calculus, and I teach physics and astronomy as well. Wow. Oh, well, we could go on all kinds of subjects and have <laughs> conversation. But um, the thing that really kind of triggered this thing is this this COVID-19. Uh, you know, uh, when you do the math, when I do simple math, I look at what's going on and I see, no, I know what exponential means and the potential for something multiplying and then that number multiplying, it's like multi-level, same yes. kind of an idea, right? Uh, so with all that's going on in the world, this has been quite an experience. I mean, to me, I think of the world as one or like on an island, we can sort of say, okay, that's our world. Yes. We're dealing with a world that somehow right now we're getting identification of uh, the United Kingdom has this many. This is what's going on in France. This is what's going on in Spain. This is the United States. And Look at all these little states. We'll break it down and separate it out. And here we have nine cases. There we have 27, 200,000. But there's this much testing here and that much testing there. I'm swimming from it all, personally. Yeah. And the information out that we have available to us is like stories about conspiracy theory and it came from a lab in Wuhan or in China or it came from the United States and everyone's fighting. To me, the issue is people are ill and we want to figure out what to do because illness is both physical and now we got this other component called economic, you know, I mean emotional, the economic thing. Like now, I, I grew up thinking that um, the, the national debt and that money used to be backed by something. I'm not sure what year we were born, yeah. but it, it was 1972 that President Richard Nixon went off the gold standard. So yeah. our dollar that was backed by dollars uh, in gold and whatever other things was actually hard currency that you could actually track the number of dollars with the amount of something hard. So everyone yep, yep. in the world was on a real standard where we knew what value was. But after that, it's gotten real vague. Yeah. And I thought our, our economy, and we talked about our U US economy, and they talked about a trillion dollar debt, $2 trillion. And that was some staggering number 
that was going to have our kids paying back and balancing this budget for the rest of their lives. And suddenly, something's changed. No one's looking at what a dollar really is worth anymore. And in recent, I guess I'm talking too much here, but I'm sort of setting it up, you know. In recent times, you know, you see a stimulus package of $2 trillion. And on the heels of it, trillion here, a few trillion there. <sighs> And then the other thing with math is people getting sick. One gets sick, and then it's nine, and then it's 81, but then they fix that, and they think it's kind of managed over here, but what about over here? That's not managed. Yeah. And it opens up. So when I heard you were a mathematician, I thought, let me take all this confusion that I'm sure everybody's got, like me. What's going on in this world now? How are we going to figure out what to do when this all stops? Well, we don't have control of what stops. So I want to hear your hit on this. I mean, please excuse me if I'm up front just going at it. But oh, yeah. to me, I just like, it's making no sense. I, I'm not having an easy time understanding what this is going to all boil down to. And You've looked at it in different ways, and I'd like to hear your math. And okay. Make it simple math for simple guys like me. <laughs> Perfect. Is that all right. All right. Yeah. So, uh, when the initial outbreak happened in the United States, we began with, you know, let's say one index case. In Washington State's case, that was uh, one patient who arrived on January 15th, was tested positive on, I think, January 21st and then was isolated. They did a little bit of contact tracing, but they really couldn't figure out where he had gone, who he had talked to. Uh, and they thought they had it pretty much under control in Washington. Then by the end of February, we had a nursing home where dozens and dozens, I think it was 75 patients had tested positive in this nursing home, including staff. And, and that ballooned eventually, I think to like 300 people just associated with that nursing home. And we were in full blown outbreak in Washington. Um, and when they did the uh, genetic testing of the people in that nursing home, it traced back to that initial index patient um, in Washington. So they, they, taste, they traced the genetic code of the virus and discovered it came from that first patient. And they're trying to figure out how the virus got from that patient into the community. Um, and they believe it may have been uh, a woman who lived near him and may have gone to the same grocery store. They don't know. But she was an elderly woman. She was in her 80s. She ended up uh, getting pneumonia and acute respiratory uh, uh, distress syndrome and was a local hospital. And when she got better, uh, they moved her into this nursing home, but she was probably still shedding virus at the time and may have spread it to everybody in the nursing home after that. Uh, from there, Washington quickly began seeing a doubling rate of infections about once every three days. So that means if you had one patient, three days later, you'd have two patients. Three days after that, you'd have four patients. Three days after that, you'd have eight patients and so on. And it becomes this exponential curve that's very steep. And little pockets around the country began appearing from that. So somebody who caught it from the nursing home in Washington ended up, I believe, in North Carolina, started spreading it there. People came from Italy to New York, began spreading the virus there. There, were, uh, uh, there was spread from the the Diamond Princess cruise ship that was in Japan, Americans got evacuated from there, brought to uh, a military base in the San Francisco Bay Area, and one of the HHS employees wasn't properly wrapped up when they met with the patients, and they spread it from their hotel room on, and so they had an outbreak in, in, in like Sausalito and places down there. Um, so what began our outbreak are these little patches, these little kind of, if you imagine doing a test Petri dish and there's a few little bacteria and these little splotches start to grow. Yeah. The same math applies in different communities around America. So right now we have basically every community in the United States has an index patient of some kind. So what began back in January with one patient and spread throughout the country, we now have that same index patient in every community we can imagine. So what we've done is we, we started mitigation efforts because so many people were infected, we couldn't isolate anymore. We, we, we're millions infected right now in the United States. And, and not being able to isolate 
these patients means we have to mitigate and reduce social interactions. So that's where you know, Hawaii closing down their borders essentially and uh, putting 14 day quarantines, requiring people to shut down their businesses where social contacts can be made such as bars and restaurants and schools and uh, uh, reducing uh, our interactions with each other because interactions is how this transmits. And this has done actually a pretty fantastic job in that our doubling rate nationally went from three days down to, I think we're at like about 14 days or so nationally in our doubling rate, which isn't great because it still means people are getting infected, but it's slow enough that our, ho our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. The problem is, is that we don't have the largest economic generators in our country, which are the social, these social, uh, these uh, uh, services like restaurants going and people's pocketbooks are being hurt. And so there's a large push to open up, to be like, okay, it's over. Uh, if we flatten the curve, let's open up and let the economic portion recover. The problem is, is that we're still only at about 1% of the country having been infected by this disease and already over 100,000 dead. That means we still have 99% of the country. So 327 million people that have yet to be infected and could potentially face you know, lifelong uh, repercussions from the illness, die. Uh, uh, suck up much of our resources and, and hospital costs. So if we open up to supposedly save these small businesses, we're going to see that doubling rate drop from 14 days down to something that's unmanageable, un un unmanageable, say below every seven days. And our hospitals are going to get overwhelmed in a hurry. And if those hospitals are overwhelmed, people aren't going to be going to those businesses and those businesses are going to hurt regardless. So that's kind of where we are is we're, we're in this like, let's pretend it's over and open everything up in a summer, but we are going to sentence people to die if we do that. Well, and we're doing that. Um, yeah. You you're, you're opening up to some phase right there yes. on your island, right? Yeah, you're, so the, the county that I'm in, Kitsap County, uh, we're entering phase two on June 1st, which means we're allowed to have limited seating in restaurants, uh, uh, barbers and salons can open up. Uh, the problem is we're a bedroom community of Seattle and we're just a ferry boat right away. And the ferry boat is the largest tourist attraction in Washington. So people just take the ferry just to be on the water and enjoy themselves. Can and they come to you without being quarantined? Yes. And so what we think really? is going to happen is, is you know, the oh. two to three million people that live in the Seattle area are going to be like, well, it's been three months since I've had a haircut, I heard Bainbridge is open, I'll head to the island and get a haircut there. And we're gonna become a COVID port where hundreds of thousands of people are going to take little day trips from Seattle, which does not qualify to reopen. They'll hop on the ferry, come to our community, they're gonna have drinks in our bars, they're gonna get their hair cut, and we're gonna be importing cases and it's gonna spread like wildfire. And uh, this piece by piece reopening doesn't work inside of a state because everyone within that state can travel and go anywhere they want. So if they want to do so shopping or, or get a haircut, they can travel easily within 30 minutes or an hour to a community that's reopened and bring with them essentially the plague. Well, we here in Hawaii on June 1st are um, opening up, sounds exactly like you, same timing. Yep. And even though we are a remote community, we are protected by a, the seems that travelers coming from the world have a 14 day quarantine, but they're not being tested before they jump on the plane. I'm not yeah. really understanding why that, why are they testing them after they arrive? Are they testing anyone before they come across on the ferry? Nope. They just hop on the ferry and they're here. So same situation. Yep. So, our situation might be, quote, a little better in that if people come over from the neighboring islands, we've been kind of more contained, but same kind of thing at a slower rate, potentially, than yours. Yes. What is, it must be a pretty loud outcry there. In uh, our... So the, the, uh, the seven, municip seven main municipalities in our county uh, voted last night whether to reopen or not, and Bainbridge Island was the only community that voted no. Uh, the, other, the other parts of the county are less progressive, more Republican, 
and more apt to believe that the virus isn't a threat, uh, less likely to wear masks, less likely to follow protocol, and they just want to be able to go to the bar and enjoy themselves. Um, but there are two other main communities that are ser served by ferries from the Seattle side. There's a little town called Kingston and then a bigger city, a Navy, Navy town uh, known as Bremerton, which has a giant shipyard. And I think both of these communities are going to get hit by people day tripping over to their to their sites to visit the restaurants. And so we might see like a huge economic boom initially because we'll be able to take in all this business from those communities, but with it is gonna be infections. And our, our county had managed to, you know, we've got this, this barrier of water. So if, if, our, if our workers aren't commuting to Seattle anymore because they're staying home to work, we aren't going to Seattle, getting the virus and bringing it back home. And so we've been averaging one or two infections a week and most of those infections have actually come from people who went on vacation to Eastern Washington to go fishing, to go camping, to go on hikes, and to visit those, that small community. And, and Eastern Washington's having a really bad problem in the rural communities at packing plants and, and, and uh, orchards. It's being spread amongst the workers. And so mm -hmm. those viruses are spreading in Yakima, they're spreading in Spokane, they're spreading in Grant County. And people go out there for outdoor recreation for a few days, come back, and they're bringing the virus back to our county. Uh, the, initially, the governor had shut down fishing for that exact reason, that people would be spreading the disease, hitting these rural, rural communities, and that's basically what's, what we're seeing happen. So now this explosion to uh, suddenly have an economic shot in the arm, uh, and with all these reinfections, that means if things shut down again, all the good that we were accomplishing in trying to slow this down and make it a more manageable thing is completely out the window. Oh, yes. Am I yeah. right? Oh, completely exactly right. Window. Yes. Uh, so with the initial infections in Washington, uh, we shut down, I think it was March 16th. And uh, I had done a, a series of uh, posts on the internet uh, showing the math of if we don't shut down, this is what we can expect as the rate of growth. And by the first week of April, Washington State would have run out of hospital beds. We just would have been out. Whether it have been, you know, 16 to 40,000 infected, 20% of those would require ICU admission, and we just would have been swamped. They shut down the 16th, and the growth rate plummeted. It dropped uh, from three days down to about 14 days, almost within a week. And uh, that's really what saved our hospital system in Washington. And we can look at... Uh, uh, regions that have reopened or partially reopened or never even really shut down that much, generally in the, in the South and the Midwest, and we can see that they're running out of hospital beds. Alabama's out of hospital beds. They, you know, they are a small rural state in Montgomery, Mobile, Birmingham. They have no more ICU beds for patients, and there's not very many hospitals in the rural communities outside of there, and they're trying to figure out where to put them all, but the governor refuses admit that his policies has resulted in a huge uh, uh, crisis in a state. So they're just pretending like everything's fine. Keep going to Applebee's, keep going to, to your salon. And it's, it's something that, that the virus doesn't care about marketing. It doesn't care about positive spin. It doesn't care about what type of campaign you put out. If you are a human being without antibodies, you're going to get infected and you're going to spread it. So, you know, we can, we can do as much of this campaigning and marketing as we can, but the virus doesn't care. It's not listening. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't talk your way out of being infected by a, a disease no one has any immunity to. And what about the people that say, ah, oh, this doesn't affect me, but they're not covering and not respecting other people yeah. and the way other people feel, whether or not they believe it, that lack of public respect for each other is, is amplifying, I don't want to say because of the president, but surely yeah. we're not getting a leader who is respecting um, everybody's personal integrity. And just by the way he approaches it, here we now see, you know, in the last day, He's now attacking social media, which he's been exploiting yes. as his way to say there's fake news out there and put out his truth. And there's suddenly check, you hear this, oh, they're yeah. checking him and now he, he wants to stop them. So 
where do we uh, really very difficult to figure out in our world now what we're what we're going to do and how we're going to address this what do you think we should do what do, what do you think we well, can do there's basically one option and only one option to successfully combat an infectious novel virus and that is shut everything down that's it if we were somehow to magically keep every american say in a separate room from every other American for 14 days, the virus would vanish. It'd be gone. But we still have needs. We still need to eat. We still need to get waste management and, and certain certain things like that. So what we've chosen to do temporarily is, is essentially shut down most everything and keep try to keep these essential services humming along so people don't starve to death. And we kind of weekly did a little shot in the arm with uh, uh, the stimulus of $1,200 for everyone by uh, extending um, uh, federal uh, unemployment aid to states for I think four months worth of unemployment to help keep people in restaurants and other un unessential businesses uh, uh, getting a paycheck so they don't again starve to death. But what other countries that are successful at managing this crisis are doing is they're not just shutting everything down but they're giving everybody a UBI. Canada's guaranteeing 2000 a month to every citizen uh, Great Britain is paying 80% of everyone's wages to keep them employed. So they technically, you know, if you worked for an airline in Britain, uh, you're still being paid by the airline, but the government's covering 80% of the cost. Same thing in Denmark and the Netherlands. And with what money? Uh, well, I mean, they're essentially printing it. It's it's <laughs> money's fake. Money isn't real. What? So. You know, when it comes to a crisis slice like this, you have to treat the health of your citizens first and worry about the economic damage later because the economic damage is going to come regardless. And after the 1918 flu, uh, uh, we had an economic depression in 1920, 1921 as a result of it. So, you know, no matter what you do, people are going to stop going out. They're going to die in appreciable percentages. So, we need to consider that and try to keep as many people alive as we can while we wait for a vaccine to be uh, tested, approved, and administered. Now, we're looking at probably still a year away from having a viable vaccine for everyone, which means we need a year of shutdown, essentially. And we just need to accept that. We need the powers to be to tell everyone this is how it's going to be. You have a year of this. Get we used don't to see, it. We don't see that now. In fact, yeah. We see exactly the opposite. We're going to have a, a national election and all these elections, and our sitting president is not only not in favor of that, he's leading the charge to what really gets me is he's oh, yeah. leading the charge. Imagine you were in government in uh, Michigan, or I don't know, I think it was Michigan, yeah. where suddenly people with guns are coming and attacking, and the, the president of the United States says, Ah, I support that. Kind of, yeah. if they have a gun anywhere near his area, right? They shut all down. Yeah. It's just gotten crazy. And the people that say, "Well, he's he's right, he's right. We can't do." What are we going to do? I, the thing that you just posed, I don't know how we can even hope to enforce that. Well, okay, so the stimulus generated by the Federal Reserve and Congress so far totals around seven billion, seven trillion dollars. That's enough money if we had just printed that $7 trillion and paid every adult not already on Social Security or disability $2,000 a month, we could do it for the next 30 months. But instead, what we did is we printed that money, lent it to banks who immediately just lost it in the stock market and it vanished into nothing. We spent trillions of dollars of, of, of allocated money from Congress and only a few hundred billion went to American citizens it, with their $1,200 one-time uh, stimulus and the rest just got frittered away into these PPE loans that will never get paid back and will never actually do the job that they need to do. And literally, we just need to pay people to stay home and that's it. If people received money every month for not doing anything and just watch, sitting on their couch and watching Netflix, they wouldn't be out there protesting. They'd be like, oh, I'm getting something for this. I'm being paid for my time to not be productive. And, you know, the, the, the bulk of these protesters, they're not, how should I put this? It's not that they want to go back to work. It's that they want people to keep working for them. 
they're willing to sacrifice their esthetician and their waiter, but you know, because they want services. They want to take somebody who works in a restaurant. They don't value their life. They don't think that they're a human being worth living. They're just there as human capital stock to serve them. Well, some of the people out there are the people that are the workers. I don't know what confusing them. They're the I, ones that- I see that more are... business owners than I do workers that, that, that are complaining. Mean? Yes. The workers are like, I don't want to go back to the restaurant. I'm going to die if I go back to the restaurant. But the restaurant owners like, I need people to get back in here so I can make my money. And we, you know, we need to pause rents. We need to pause mortgages, pay everyone to stay home and just ride this one out. So and, let's now pose, let's run the clock ahead a little bit. Okay. Georgia has been open for a month, whatever mm -hmm. period. And I'm hearing that, you know, they, they keep trying to show you, oh, well, it hasn't really gone up yet. I don't know how they want to keep isolating this area. Somehow yeah. they think, but it's starting to go up again. So let's yep. say now somewhere along the line, I, I'm not sure who, we've got a president who somehow is fighting it. Yes. You know, I, I don't really know what to say here. We don't have anyone in our favor that's looking to shut this down. Uh, leg legislate simply to give money to everyone in America. You saw by the first, <laughs> the first yeah. package and seven trillion dollars, like you said, a small fraction of that actually going to the people. Yeah. So do we have another chance at this? What uh, are we do? Likely not. Uh, the, the Republicans seem pretty intent to just let Grandma die. And that seems to be their, their, their entire MO is like, well, we tried, we spent a lot of money, oh well. The problem is, is that while the, the, the blue states, the New York, California, Wa uh, Washington, those places got hit the hardest first because those are large cities with international airports. And it hit those places first because of their trade with China and Italy. Uh, uh, it spread from there into these rural communities. The blue states locked down, they flattened their curve very early. The red states were slow to react. And when they did react, they kind of half-heartedly did it. And then they turned it off too soon. Those red states have high morbidities, high comorbid comorbidities. Uh, uh, we're talking more than a third of the population being overweight or diabetic, heart disease, uh, uh, renal problems, hypertension, you know, the a third of America is obese and obesity has, you know, a 10 to 15% mortality when they get infected with, with, with this disease. So if every person with diabetes in America gets infected, we're looking at just 4 million deaths from that alone. And these numbers are not clicking in the heads of these elected politicians, especially in the red states, because they have this weird, I would say it's that, that American exceptionalism idea that like it's something that happens to someone else, not to them. And they yeah. just can't, they just can't imagine that they are a fleshy ball of goo that's susceptible to infection. It's just like everyone else. And so they just believe that they're not going to be infected and they still want to go to Applebee's and enjoy their meal. So they're going to be hit really hard. And these rural areas also have really poor healthcare systems. Rural hospitals have been shutting down in the hundreds across the country for the last decade. And you know, they don't have the beds, they don't have the doctors, they don't have the nurses, they don't have the equipment. And so I fear that Trump and Republican governors are going to kill off their base. Their base is older, their base is more conservative. And those are the people that are generally also have high comorbidities, age and, and health wise, that you know, they're going to lose an appreciable percentage of their electorate and it's going to demographically change the election come November, November, especially if we have a second peak coming August, September, October, that can wipe out, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people. If, if we don't cap this, we don't flatten the curve once again. Where so, does wisdom get, uh, get to policy? I mean, here, with an executive order, yeah. Trump yeah. is trying to close down social media. Do we have no control over what's going to happen here? It seems uh, like our system of government isn't letting us, the people, with 
Well, I mean, what you said seems to be very basic wisdom to me. And it it's, may not be comfortable to a lot of people to be sitting around and well, it's, it's, get it's, money it's, that'll take away some of the pain. Yeah, it's 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 pretty phenomenal. If 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 you look at the 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 polling being done about, you know, are you staying home? Are you using a mask? Are you doing these things? About seventy-five to eighty-five percent of the population were asked if are you willing to go back to restaurants if you're open? They said no. So, you know, a overwhelming majority, 75% or more of the country will not go back to restaurants until there's a vaccine. And if you look at Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, uh, uh, Texas, the, what they're seeing is the restaurants are only at 15% capacity. They open back up and people aren't coming back to their restaurants. So the infections are happening amongst this small population that's, that, that, believes that this virus isn't, a, isn't going to affect them. And those are the ones that are being hit really hard. The same thing is happening in Sweden. So Sweden is famously doing the let's reach herd immunity uh, experiment. And they have the highest mortality rates in Europe. They have uh, runaway infection. And they thought, okay, we're, we're only a couple weeks away from having herd immunity. And then they got their antibody test back and they discovered that, you know, only 7% of Stockholm and less than 3% of the rest of, rest of the country has been infected and they're at 4,000 deaths. And they're like, oh my God, if we reach herd immunity, that's another 60 to 100,000 deaths in our small country. And so they're freaking out. But the Swedish people, 85% of them have removed themselves from society. They've stepped back and they're not, they're not going to restaurants. They're not going out. So the people who have been affected are only that small 15% that doesn't believe that that they can be infected and everyone else still hasn't gone out to, to, you know, do their part in getting infected and, in increasing herd immunity. So, you know, the, the bravado from this minority is what's the loudest and it's, that's what everyone's hearing, but they're, they're such a small minority compared to everyone else. And the difference is that small minority, they're willing to show up to the, you know, Michigan state house with their guns and, and drive their $60,000 trucks and demand to get a haircut you know, they're loud, they're banding together, and they're being heard, but that 85% of the population is like, well, why would I go to a protest where I could get sick? So you're not going to hear their voices. You're not going to hear them chanting at the state house to stay closed because wisely they're staying home and avoiding, you know, transmission of the virus. So there, there's an incredible disconnect between, you know, what we're hearing and what people actually believe. And the, the, the loud micro voices that are you know, I hate to be that conspiracy theorist, but all of these these reopening websites and the Facebook groups, they're all being run by like one group out of Jacksonville, Florida. And, you know, the, this one man re created all 50 like, reopen Washington, reopen California, reopen Montana websites. And he's stoked and scheduled all these protests from Florida. And, and you know, it's not an organic uh, 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 a movement yeah. it's not a grassroots movement it's it's something planned by an individual trying to stoke you know uh uh inst instigate confrontation and it's not you know it, we need leadership that can be like it's time to shut up now stay home so until we, we have a vaccine <laughs> so between now and the election never mind i don't want to give them any ideas but yeah they could declare martial law and uh, yep. decide to postpone the election. Yep. I mean, I don't mean to be radical about it, but well, we're realistic here. We well, have the, someone that's out of control. Yep. I consider oh, yeah. him out of control. Yep. Um, it's, what, it's, what are we going to do? Are we going to hit is, a revolution point? I wonder. You People know, the, the things I can predict, I can predict, you know, uh, uh, rates of doubling. I can predict how many people are going to be infected, how many hospital beds we're going to need, things like that. The human reaction component is something that is so intangible that the variable can't be defined. And how people react to this pandemic is is phenomenal and unique. You know, I have friends that are 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 you know liberal Democrats, socialists that just can't accept that the virus is real, and they're they are all of a sudden swiveling to these hard right, you know, white supremacist 
YouTube blogs where they're being told that the virus isn't real or it comes from 5G towers and all sorts of weird, you know, Kremlin propaganda that gets seeded into, into our country. And their entire, entire political ideals are flipping the way that I saw it, saw it happen after 9-11 with a lot of people. You know, comedian Dennis Miller was one of the most outspoken liberals in America. 9-11 happened and it broke something in his brain and he became a conservative oh. firebrand. And, you know, the, it, how we, we react to this as A, a coping mechanism and B, a, a, a instantaneous reactionary response to threat is something that happens on an individual level and i just i i i honestly can't predict how how we're going to do that but i do see the powers that be using this crisis to exploit whatever they can so i expect to see trump you know try to keep states from doing uh mail-in ballots because if you don't have mail-in ballots you have an excuse to cancel or postpone or or do other things that are unconstitutional regarding the election and I do see him wanting perhaps people to get sick. So he has an excuse to be like, oh, it's too unsafe to have a national election. We must postpone it. The weird thing is, is that if we postpone an election, January 20th, Trump stops being president regardless. And Nancy Pelosi becomes president. So there's, there's nothing about Congress having their terms removed if there's no election, but it is written in the constitution that Trump is no longer president as of January 20th and Pence is no longer vice president. So Nancy Pelosi would become president of the United States. So it might backfire on him if he decides to postpone the election. <laughs> yeah, still, there's still a secession there. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. back when we get out of politics and we get back yeah. to the human part, the humanity, we're talking about I don't want to give numbers. You can tell me, but it sounds like millions of people will die. Oh, You're yes. You're talking hundreds of thousands. We're, I don't see that. We're already on pace to lose about a million people by this time next year. That's, that's if infections do not grow. If we do not see the, the number of infections each day uh, hit that exponential curve, we will lose over a million people by this time next year. If we see growth, we see second wave, two to three million. And those are confirmed cases. The, the interesting thing about the, the, what, what we're seeing with uh, mortalities is in Northern Italy, you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bulgarmo, I believe, they had um, from March 1st to March 24th, they had around 400 deaths. And during that time, the previous year, they only had around 90 deaths. So subtract those 90 natural deaths, you're at 300 plus uh, uh, deaths occurring in those three and a half weeks, but only 136 of those deaths were actually recorded as uh, COVID related. They still had 200 plus deaths that, that were the result of, you know, natural death at home, uh, 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 other COVID related deaths such as stroke and heart attack that happened from uh, extreme response to this disease, usually in young people. Young people are seeing lots of strokes and heart attacks. So it would be interesting to see you know, come January when the Social uh, Security Department announces how many Social Security cards have been canceled due to mortalities, how many people actually had die? In New York, they were having 400 deaths a day from heart attack at home when you, they only had 20 deaths a day prior. So, you know, not all those deaths got recorded as COVID deaths. I have friends who were in their 30s that just dropped dead back in April and March, and, and they dropped dead from strokes and heart attacks and they never got tested. They, you know, we, we never saw why a 36 year old man would drop dead of a heart attack. And, and yet it happened. They're not being recorded as COVID deaths. So, so let me ask you a question because yeah. I'm hearing all those people out there that are saying, well, oh, this is fake news. Where does he get his statistics? Yeah. Your statistics are personal and are conservative. That's what you keep. I keep hearing you talking to kind of diminish the numbers because I see, you know, when I ex realize exponential, I see much bigger numbers. Much oh, we're, bigger we're you know, if, 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 we, if we acted like we were acting in February nationally, you know, prior to believing that there was, there was, there was infections everywhere, 
yeah. we would we would have had a doubling rate that was every three days, which would have meant between February 1st and today, there would have been about 160 million Americans infected by this disease. That's that's what what shutting down did for us was to basically reduce that doubling rate from three days to 14 days and saved essentially five to 10 million lives. So, you know, if, if every single American gets infected by this virus, we're looking at 10 to 20 million dead. And uh, staggering. That's staggering. Right. It's absolutely mind blowing. Now, what, what did New Zealand do? I understand New yes. Zealand just said, that's it. Yep. Nobody in, nobody out. What, yep. What's going on there? I, I have a, a friend and their family are actually stuck in New Zealand. They can't get out. Uh, and two friends that got out on basically the last flight, they had gone to New Zealand to do a year abroad and travel on a camper van. And then they got there and within days, everything shut down. <laughs> so they were stuck for about a month in this one community living in their van uh, and managed to get out on basically the last flight. But New Zealand did it right. They shut down. They said, okay, we're going to give everybody a UBI, universal basic income. And we're just going to sit tight for the next year until a vaccine's available. And if you're on an island, that's the luxury you have. You can do that. And so they have no more infections. The last patient left the hospital, I think, this week and is recovered. And they have no, no way for transmission to come back into the country because they're not letting anyone in. So that's kind of the route you have to take. Um, so what would you do if you were Hawaii and you, you know, I mean, I'm, we now talking the barge, the young brothers is saying, oh, we are running into a money problem now. We mm -hmm. need 25 million to keep yeah. going. And we're, we're going to run into this same issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's going to be an economic component no matter what, what choice you take, whether it's going to be reopening or whether it's being shutting down. The thing is only one of those saves lives. You know, you, you open Hawaii back up, all of a sudden you're going to be dealing with, with hospital costs that are far beyond anything that's sustainable. So um, who's going to tell the governor and the lieutenant governor this message? Is that us? I, I think so. It has, it has to be, you know, the people. Um, you know, if Hawaii starts taking in millions of visitors and local transmission begins to ha spread throughout the community, you know, A, people will stop coming as tourists, and B, your local population is going to overwhelm the meager hospital beds you already have. Yep. And, you know, if, if half the people get infected don't require hospitalization, so 50% are asymptomatic, uh, they're carriers of the virus, but they aren't displaying uh, 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 symptoms. The other half display symptoms. And of that half, around 40 to 50% of them have severe enough symptoms that require hospitalization. Now, that hospitalization runs for about 10 to 40 days before recovery or death. And it costs about $4,000 a day for every day one of those patients is in these ICUs. So you're looking at hospital bills from thirty dollars to $150,000 per patient for every patient that has to go to a hospital. That's 20% of the infected people are looking at hospital bills that rival four years of college. So... You know that's unsustainable. The, the Kaiser Permanente, the 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 other insurance companies that operate in Hawaii, they're not they're going to declare bankruptcy before they pay all those bills. They aren't going to be able sure. to afford that. Nationally, if we look, if we have, you know, the uh, Imperial College in London was saying that within a year, about forty to seventy percent of the U.S. population is going to be infected, even with mitigation efforts. So, forty to seventy percent. Let's just say it's about 160 million Americans are infected within the next year. Okay, that is around 30 million hospitalizations that require ICU. 30 million hospitalizations that all have, let's say, 20 days of being in the hospital. So you're looking at 60, 600 million days of hospitalization <laughs> total. Well, first of all, we don't, have enough, a day. we don't have enough. We don't have enough equipment. We don't have enough oh. hospitals. No, we only have a million beds in the United States. So we're looking at 29 million more people than beds we have being infected. Well, and, and you know, some people say, oh, you're just blowing it up. Yeah. You, you, your math is, I, I don't mean to be funny. You're conservative, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I, I you know, uh, 
uh, I was interviewed uh, by a local podcast, and and when I came up with my data, and everyone was like, "Oh, you're a scaremonger. Why would you say these things?" And then we revisit a month later, my data was all conservative. It got it was actually worse than what I had predicted. So you know, take the numbers I have and just expect them to be worse than what I'm saying. And the numbers I'm saying are pretty apocalyptic. You know, 600 million hospital days for Americans at $4,000 a day. We're looking at you know, a full quarter of our entire GDP just going to ICU healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. $8 trillion just going to hospital care for patients. Never mind that everything else is going to have to reclose down again. Exactly. Yes. And all the money, what did you say? Uh, 30 months, a $2,000 a head? Yep. For every adult that's on Social Security or disability. Yeah. So what would that be? How much money is about, that? About se seven trillion. Seven. Yeah. Which is what so, we already spent. But exactly. then when all this is said and done, uh, then it has to somehow, we have to, we have to rebuild everything. This oh, is, yeah. Yeah. We, are we going to learn? Uh, isn't that a good question for our world? Are we going to learn to cooperate and help each other? Or are we going to uh, hold on to some old model here? I, mm. that's, that's what's going on now, the old model. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I think, I hate to be a pessimist, but I think it's going to be more brutal until, until people have learned their lesson. There's a large segment of the population that has to touch the, touch the stove to learn their lesson. Yeah. You know, I, you still see stories of these protesters that are like, oh, COVID is not real. And then they die from the infection or they get themselves and go into, into an induced coma for two weeks and they come out of it and they're like, oh, it was so wrong. You know, you have to avoid this. And they have to learn their lesson the hard way before they can come to this realization. It's, it's one of those situations where, you know, a smart man learns from their mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Well, we've got a few smart people, not very many wise people, and a whole bunch of stupid people <laughs> that have to touch the stove. And, and the, that's just going to be the reality of it. Um, so can we, I mean, here we are. Uh, yeah. um, we're a few days before things open. Yep. If I go to the mayor and I just run this scenario, mm -hmm. what are my chances of having him say, Jason, I see what you're saying. Let's shut it all down. I would zero percent virtual zero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah. So, what the business interests do? The we business are, interests are too powerful. And what about food? Ninety yeah. percent of the food coming to these islands is coming from off island. Ninety yep. percent. Yeah. You'd think that everyone would be scrambling on every inch of land to be growing food mm -hmm. to be. None of that's happening. No. Oh, it's pretty phenomenal. I, you know, I went to school in Hilo, and every yard had uh, banana trees, had uh, 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 pineapples and whatnot, and no one ate the trees in their own yard. They all went to Safeway. They bought bananas that came from Chile or Costa Rica or something, and they ate those. So, you know, hopefully you've got enough sustainable just plants in your yard that you can ignore the grocery store for a while and live off of that. Uh, but yeah, Hawaii, Hawaii faces a real predicament because they're such an import economy. So, yeah. you know, they, there has, there's going to be some level of transaction involved. The different, the, what's going to depend on that is, are you going to see relief from the federal government? And that's, the federal government has the ability to print money and we need to utilize that, that leverage now. You know, there's no reason we should be racking up debt in this time because, you know, we're not, we don't have to worry about inflation, namely because we print all this money, we pay people UBI, but they're not buying homes with it. They're not, you know, buying cars with it. It's just enough money to survive and maybe maybe save a little bit, but it doesn't. It's not enough to to instigate a rush on 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 these uh, uh, large purchases that would cause inflation to happen. People aren't traveling, so gasoline prices aren't going to go up. Uh, so it's kind of a, a unique situation where you can literally print money and not see the, the rapid inflation as a result of it. And it's just kind of like a unique situation. So we might as well use that situation to flood the economy with cash 
so that people can survive and we can we can guarantee their 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 way of life for the next year before we can get the virus out to the, the vaccine out to them and recover. And some people don't want to do with vaccines, so they'll yeah. either make it or break it based yeah. on other things. I mean, there are yep. lots. I've seen some treatments that they're using in China, like they use this hydroxy hydrogen machine, that because mm. hydrogen can help uh, it reduce inflammation in the lungs. The percentage of people that go on these ventilators that die yeah. is very, very high. Oh yeah. So yeah. Th there's all kinds of solutions that no one is implementing here. And there's a guy on Maui making these machines. I, and uh, I told you up in uh, West Virginia, uh, there's a guy getting it from China and making these machines to create hydrogen and oxygen for people. And they're like non-existent. But to be able to yeah. ramp up and do that, we hear them making ventilators. How about tests? I mean, I, yeah. this whole thing is crazy. Whatever we just said, how do we know all we got unless we test? Yeah, the the, the, the testing problem is a huge issue because huge. again, you have you have half the population that will be asymptomatic, so they won't know they have it while they're shedding the virus. And the other part of the population is the the incubation period can be anywhere from four to 27 days before they, before they have uh, symptoms. So they're shedding the virus the entire time. If you're somebody that's at three weeks before they show symptoms and they go in for a test and you know, the, the, the investigators have to do contact tracing, no one can remember who they talked to over that three week period, who they met with, where they were, you know, oh, was I on Home Depot that day or the day before? I don't remember, you know, so, the uniqueness of this virus is almost just evil in that way. And then it makes contact tracing damn near impossible. And a lot of and, people are also saying we're losing our rights. Oh yeah. We'll never get them back. So yeah. I mean, uh, that silly stuff is 1918. We saw a pan global pandemic and cities shut down. They stopped travel. They refused to let people into public transportation if they weren't, weren't wearing masks. And guess what? We got our rights back when it was over. So, you know, it, it, there have been plagues throughout humanity where it required isolation, quarantining, and social distances for since animal husbandry began. And that's the MO for all of society for all time. The only reason we exist, you and I exist, is because our ancestors did that hundreds of years ago in their communities back in Europe whenever there was a plague. So, you know, we exist today because of that. You know, the, the Hawaiian people, the Hawaiian people were isolated for thousands of years in the middle of Pacific. And when white people showed up, they brought the cold virus with them and the cold virus wiped out 90% of their population. So, you I, know- That's a piece of history there. Exactly, you know, the, the Hawaiian Islands could support over a million people with the land that was there. And because they didn't have the animal husbandry and because they didn't have the virus transfers from, from more populated continents, they survived just fine. But when it's a novel virus, a novel virus is a different animal. You know, if, if, if you don't, if your body has no history of being exposed to such a virus, it, it can wipe, wipe out appreciable percentages of the population like that. And, and we have to imagine ourselves as a Western Hemisphere native people pre-contact and think of ourselves as we are just as susceptible to this new virus as they were to the viruses from Europe when contact was made that wiped out 90% of their populations. They had they had they had a, they had a bit of a uh, uh, a bit more against them in that they were dealing with four four novel coronaviruses and like eight flu viruses that they got hit with at the same time, whereas we only have one virus to worry about. But yeah. the susceptibility is 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 unique to a novel virus, and it, it's just something that really has to be taken consideration that we still have ninety to ninety percent of the population yet to be infected. Wow. You know, we could talk about this forever. Believe it or not, we've we've been speaking a, a full hour, and uh, I don't know if we're any closer. To, if you would sum it up, and yeah. you want to, what would you say? Give it a, a summation. I'm not sure where we're going with this, yeah. except to maybe I'll get this tape to the lieutenant governor and the governor okay. and the mayor. Yeah. But I would say someone was giving them coaching before yeah. they're making their moves. No. Well, I, I, would, I would say that mathematically, you're economically doomed no matter what you do. 
If you, if you shut everything down, you're doomed. If you open everything up, you're doomed. But only one of those methods saves lives and that's shutting things down. So go with the one that saves lives because you're going to be economically obliterated either way. So here comes in a couple of days, they're going to open it up and I'm not sure when they're going to evaluate time to close it down again, yep. but how do we stop this? I mean, I'm, yeah. we don't, do we? You don't. And because the incubation period is so long, every time you go to shut it down, you're still going to have a huge spike three weeks later. Yeah. So, so it's going to be always too late when you go to shut it down. And the only one that can really keep our economy going here is federal dollars. Exactly. Like yep. It's got to be it. done at a federal level. Yeah. The states can't print money. So the states are going to run out of money. And you know, the, the president is already threatening states. If they don't open up religious institutions and deem them essential, they're going to lose federal money. So all these states have to let churches open up. And churches religious centers everywhere across the globe, it's religious congregations that are the biggest spreaders of the disease because they get close together, they scream and yell and chant and sing, and they exporate so much of the virus that hundreds and thousands in one venue can get infected. In Washington, they had a choir practice of 60 people, 45 of them got infected and several died. You know, the church in, in Seoul where 1,500 people got infected. In Iran where the numbers we don't even know what the true numbers are in Iran, but we're probably seeing hundreds of thousands have died there most likely, and millions and millions and millions have been affected. And it's because there's a religious practice with, with the Shiite Muslims where they go to a certain, certain uh, site and they kiss a rock. It's on a wall. And millions of people cycled through and kissed the same rock and they went back to their communities and just spread the virus like crazy. So, you know, I, I like to tell people that in the Bible, God tells you exactly what to do when there's a plague and that's stay home. We have an entire holiday called Passover all about that. You know, just stay home until it's over. That's what God told you to do. He didn't say go to church. He didn't say go to synagogue. He said, stay home until it's over. So just stay home. That's it. That's the simplest method. Do what, do what God said. <laughs> well, Houston, you've been a uh, really good guest. Um, scaring the hell out of me, but I was, when I say scaring the hell out of me, the thing that scares me is there's not a lot of wisdom going on here. No. And that's what scares me because um, I'm one of those older Americans. Yep. And, uh, you know, I can think I'm stronger than dirt, but we can see it's just it's happening to all kinds of people. And like yeah. you say, and they're not counting so many people as COVID deaths, even though we hear people saying they're counting all of them as COVID deaths. No, it's you undercounted said. by uh, probably oh. 20 to 40 percent, if not more. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> Someone wants something. Uh, there we go. Now I'll know to show up, shut off my phone, right? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you've been a really. Oh, man, some, they, they really want you. They want me. You know, that's the thing, you know, because I've been helping people. A lot of people don't stop asking for help. They don't know when Jason has given enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty crazy out there. Well, you've been a terrific guest. I'd love to talk about astrophysics, but now isn't the time for that. I, I also want to thank Carol Ann for putting us in touch. Um, yeah, she's a wonderful lady. Yeah, and you've been a terrific guest. And a wonderful guy. I'm sorry we have to do what I say. I'm sorry we meet under these circumstances, but it's been a pleasure. Well, we can, we can visit again in, in a few months after everything's opened up and we can go, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, I guess yes. so. The only solace you get situation is, well, I told you. That's <laughs> Come solace. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Sure. It's been a pleasure and I uh, hope you have a nice evening. All right. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Aloha. Aloha.